right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to turn to the book of Hebrews. And we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 13. And we're going to kind of slow down uh, here in the book of Hebrews. Uh, this last chapter of the book of Hebrews, we're going to slow down and begin to look at these, uh, probably these last few, uh, this last chapter a little more closely and a couple more things we want to bring out. Uh, well, I can't believe it. We're already here in the month of June. Can you believe it's already June? Uh, summer has started for school. Uh, my kids are already tired of looking at each other. I've mentioned that before. Uh, summer has already started and they already need a vacation. Uh, Sometimes that can happen. Um, if, I don't know if you're like me, uh, but growing up, I wasn't really good at scripture interpretation. And so I read the verse uh, out of Proverbs 17:17 17, 17, that says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And I thought that that meant my brother was there so I could fight with him. I thought that's what that meant. He was the adversity that was there, and he felt the same about me as well. But uh, that's not what the passage means. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a friend and a brother. It, it's a dualism. It's a, a, they're seen together. A friend and a brother are there, especially for hard times. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. And as we're uh, reading Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, uh, it, it really is, is pointing just to one point tonight. And the one point is actually right there in the very first verse. It says this, it says, uh, verse one, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were, your, as if you were there yourself. Remember also those mistreated as if you felt the pain in your own bodies. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you. And I pray, God, that you would just speak your word tonight. And I pray that we would be challenged. And I pray that we would be encouraged. And most of all, God, that we would respond. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Like I said earlier, uh, having come to the last chapter of, of Hebrews, we want to slow down primarily because the book of Hebrews was not written to this congregation. Did you know that? Uh, it's, it's actually kind of the, this is what the book of Hebrews is mostly about, is that the people like us are in the congregation. The book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, it was written to the Jewish people, the Jewish Christians specifically that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, the Roman area. And there was this new thing that was happening in their day. And it's kind of fortunate that we're actually looking at Hebrews chapter 13 tonight with what's going on in our culture and that we've just finished up studying the book of Romans, which is Paul's, uh, the gospel according to Paul. And the big question that Paul addressed and answered in the book of Romans is, who is Christ? And secondly, what does that mean for the church? And the church is now this giant inclusion of Gentiles and Jews together. And so we have this fortunate timing of coming to the end of Romans and now coming even to the end of Hebrews where we begin to look at this picture of the Jews and the Gentiles in the same house together. And this new covenant church that uh, outgrew the synagogue, right? That no longer had those same practices, that outgrew the temple. And as we've looked through the book of Hebrews, we have this new covenant, which means that there's a new temple and a new priest, Christ, and a new practice for his people, and a new people all together, and a foundational truths to the church that, that today is made up primarily of Gentiles. And somewhere along the way in that transition from the Jews to primarily, primarily Jews to primarily Gentiles, a lot of things changed. As we read the book of Hebrews, as you've read, uh, hopefully along with us, as you've studied the first 12 chapters, you've noticed that it is trying to convince the Jewish people, look, a lot of what we're holding on to in this worship, this Old Testament, Old Covenant worship, is very traditional and not that it's bad, but that it's not necessary in the New Covenant. And a lot of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, a lot of the Jewish Christians were struggling with how do we worship alongside people who don't have the same culture and the same history as us? How can we come together? And that's the reason the writer of Hebrews has written this long passage to his people. 
saying this is how we adapt. This is what Christ is the fulfillment. Not inventing a new thing, but Christ is the fulfillment of the old so that the worship in the new reflects the old. And is much more welcoming, not just to a nation that was called out among an entire earth, but now open even to the ends of the earth. And somewhere along the way, I'm afraid in church history, because the Gentiles have outnumbered the Jews, sometimes that has turned into persecution even against the Jews. Even against the first ones that were there. Sometimes the the thought, even anti-Semitism, comes from the thought That they're the ones who killed Christ. And they're not. We are. Our sins put him on the cross. He died in our place for our sins. That's the point and the purpose. But too many times we've taken scripture and twisted it. To our own means and to our own ends. And we looked last, uh, not last week, two Wednesdays ago. At Hebrews 12 verses 28 and 29 that finished off that passage that we looked at. That says, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us, uh, thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Which sounds an awful lot like our study from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. That says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Here's what I want us to start with tonight. As we slow down and look at the book of Hebrews and how it finishes up. Let us let the Bible challenge us to live and think differently. If you're reading the Bible and you're getting it 100%, you agree 1,000% that it's telling you exactly what you've always believed, maybe you're not reading it right. But it should be a challenge and encouragement for us to do to live differently. I don't, I've never been mudding necessarily, but I love to watch YouTube videos of mudding. And, and there's this thing called a mud bog. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say mudding? Driving big trucks and things through mud. And what they do is they, they will hitch a, a rope or a cord or something to the back of the vehicle and they will drive as far as they can through this giant mud hole. And very few of them make it. And when someone either breaks an axle or wrecks his truck or something like that, he'll just call it off and he'll just, you know, give the signal. And they'll use that cord to bring him back out of the mud. And the next guy, he'll hook up and he'll go right through the exact same spot that the next guy, the first guy went through. And sometimes that's, I think, what we do as Christians is that we hit a mud hole in our life and we cannot make it and Jesus rescues us from it. And we say, watch this, Jesus, I'll make it this time. Instead of responding to a different direction. What he pulls us out of, let us not run headlong into again. Here's what he says in in verse 1. Here's this one point. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Lacey and I had a fight one time when we were dating. And it happened somewhere along the way that uh, we were driving in the car and I said something about one of my family members. And just kind of venting about some frustrations that I had. And then she, it wasn't Tommy, (laughs) it wasn't my brother. And then she expressed some frustrations about that family member. And I took offense at it because it's okay for me to talk about that family member, right? Because that's my family. But when she talks about it, as someone who has grown up loving that family member, I don't know that she loves him the way that I love him. You know, it's a him now. Anyway, (laughs) as you know, right, as you as you can tell, I am not convinced But my wife now has loved my family long enough to know, for me to know, that I know she loves my family. I want us to read this understanding that brotherly love means the ability to stick in and to hold fast with someone, even in the midst of struggle. That even if you don't agree, even if there's problems, you don't stop loving. 
The Hebrews here in, in reading it, it's like reading someone else's journal. This, this inner commentary to the Jewish believers and this impassioned evangelism to Jewish seekers. This encouragement for Jewish cultural traditionalists. And Christians living in a Jewish context now include worshiping alongside other believers who grew up in that different context, right? And so what he's saying is we need to continue to, we looked two weeks ago in verse 14 in chapter 12, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. This familial brotherly love must continue. Good or bad, you got to stay loving. Whenever Lacey and I started dating, uh, she asked her daddy, Daddy, can I date this boy? And she said, he said to her, he said, Does he wear boots? And she said, no. And he said, don't bring him inside. (laughs) Uh, uh, His picture, his thoughts of who was going to date his daughter was a guy who was going to be wearing boots, right? Uh, His first response to me was not really necessarily inclusive. But let me tell you, uh, there have been times uh, in my relationship with her father that I have disappointed him, that I have let him down. He's, He's told me in no uncertain terms that I can date his daughter and I can drive his truck but I'm not supposed to even get near the tractor, okay? There's, there's so many things in our life that we've undergone, but I've, I know that I've disappointed him. I know that I've disagreed or that he's disagreed with me. And I know, to be honest with you, I can recall the things that I've done that are just downright stupid and that I wish I could have done differently and taken, taken back. And I'm not who he might have originally picked for his daughter, but I'm who he got. Pray for it, right? Pray for it. Well, let me tell you, if you identify as a Christian, you have a new family. And you might not agree with them all the time. And you might be disappointed or even angry at them. And you might think that things said and done can be downright stupid. But family is supposed to be there for the hard times. Someone asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Who's my brother? And Jesus told the story of a guy who acted like a brother. A guy who acted like a neighbor. When my grandfather passed away many years ago, Brother Joe Perkins and Phyllis Friday came to the funeral. And they didn't know my grandfather, but they knew me. And they came because they're family. Practice brotherly love. Brotherly love must continue. And an outflowing of that, you see verse 2 that says, uh, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some have done this, some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. The the picture here is is that you practice hospitality, you show kindness. Uh, Some of us don't even know what the word hospitality means. Whenever I was in seminary, we were going through uh, 1 Timothy 2 and talking about the qualifications for a pastor, qualifications uh, for a deacon. And um, one of the things that said is that he must be hospitable. And they said, well, raise your hand if you know what hospitable means. And of course, I'm a college educated person sitting in seminary, obviously really brilliant. I raised my hand and I said, hospitable means able to visit hospitals, <laughs> which is not the right answer. I said, it's just not. And it means to be able to receive someone, to receive them, to, to practice hospitality. To welcome especially strangers, people that you don't know. Whenever it references here, entertaining angels, it's a, it's a reference to Genesis 18 and 19 where Abraham welcomed strangers into his tent as they were traveling along to Sodom. And he gave them food and he gave them rest and he gave them conversation. He was over and abundantly kind and gracious to him. And it says that they blessed him and said, this time next year, you're going to have a son and his name will be Isaac. And those very strangers left the hospitality of Abraham's tent and went into the town of Sodom where they were greeted not with hospitality, but with hostility. And God brought judgment on those on that town. 
I tell you that because I want you to see that the reason that, that Abraham was rewarded was not because he did the good thing, but because he reflected the, the character of God. Abraham was acting in contrast with the world around him and demonstrated a Christian life. In the context of this passage, we're, uh, our, it's hard for us to get because here we have a La Quinta and we have you know, cabins to rent and VRBO and all kinds of places that you can go and stay. Well, well in this context, there were not necessary. Excuse me, not necessarily nice hotels to go and stay at and nice places, but a lot of times the hotels and the hostels were places of great immorality. And for Christians, they would welcome people into their host houses so that they didn't have to go to those places where they could be uh, in danger. And hospitality is more than just hosting dinner parties and, and especially hosting dinner parties for your, for your friends. Hospitality in today's culture is more about receiving someone into your home and your life and your conversation and your circle of friends. And please, into your church. That you would welcome strangers into your trust and your care and your concern and your provision. Hospitality is a witness even to the lost of the unconditional love of, God's, of God towards strangers. And even to people that are different to us. And that, that we would be gracious, welcoming, and kind without having to accept false doctrine. You can welcome someone who's not a Christian. And you can welcome them and share the gospel by the way you act and by the way you speak. And the gospel you share. So hospitality is an outworking of this brotherly love. But, but I think verse 3 is the part that's most appropriate for our day. For our time right now. It says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Again, context is key. And so when he talks about prisoners here, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation that we think prison's there, prison's here, we should go do prison ministry. Absolutely, let's go do prison ministry. But that's not the only application here. When we talk about prisons, we're talking about people primarily who may have committed crimes, but we're not really sure. There's no assumption of innocence or presumption of innocence. There's no innocence until proven guilty. And so sometimes you'll have people in prison waiting for trial. Sometimes you will have people in prison who have not committed any crimes at all, but simply owe a debt. And instead of, there's no way to, to, to collect that debt, they will put this person in prison and the family must work and scrape and find money to get this person out of prison. Or they'll be sold even into slavery. Sometimes we hear about Paul being in prison. And, and Paul was certainly not alone in being a, a prisoner for his faith that was persecuted because of his faith, uh, put into prison, not for anything that he did, but just for infractions of people that didn't like him. And this is the problem with prisons. This is the, the need that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, is that prisoners are in need because they are easily forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. And not only that, but prisoners are in need because they are treated badly. And prisoners are, need, are in need because they're neglected. Um, because if, if you identify yourself with one of them, it's very possible that you could become one of them. Paul writes in his book, Second Timothy, about a guy named Onesiphorus. And Onesiphorus, he says, Onesiphorus searched hard for me until he found me and he continued to meet my needs as I was in prison. And he says, pray, bless the Lord uh, for the family of Onesiphorus. The thought is that Onesiphorus connected himself so well with Paul that he began to suffer as well. And in 2 Timothy, Paul writing to, Paul, to Timothy Tells him the temptation to distance yourself from this people or from this situation. Or Timothy, your, your temptation to distance yourself from me 
the person in need, is natural, but it is not spiritual. He tells Timothy to be willing to suffer, to identify with them, to identify with him. 2 Timothy 1, 6-8 says, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either. Even though I'm in prison for Him, with the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. We wear a lot of hats in our world. And so if we could just take off whatever hats might get in the way of us hearing from God tonight. Let's do that. Let's, let, let's take off any political hats that we think might keep us from hearing God's word. Or any emotional responses or emotional reactions. Any personal stories, personal convictions, personal problems. Anything financial or anything uh, cultural that might tell us how we're supposed to respond to the world around us. And let's dwell in, dig in with what it is to be spiritual. What it is to be spirit led. Let me ask this question. If God is your father. Then you have brothers and sisters right now. Who are hurting in the midst of struggle. How can we have the courage to go with them. And be with them. In the midst of their trial. We have brothers and sisters in the midst of emotional crisis. That feel attacked. And that feel abused. And that feel alone. And that nobody is listening. And over and over and over I have heard the word exhausted. Exhausted. Right now our African American friends and neighbors. Are struggling. And even as I say that I know that in this. Crowd of white people. Some of us may still struggle with, well, what about policemen? Well, what about uh, business owners? Well, what about the people who are, yes, I get it. There's a lot of suffering. But here's the problem is a lot of times we think we got to pick one. We don't. You don't have to pick a side. And let me also say this very clearly. You can't pick a side. That all people that, that the, he writes here that, that as if you were being mistreated, as if you felt the pain in your own bodies. The phrase there is because you are vulnerable yourself. What he's saying is we're all people. We're not politics. We're not placeholders. We're not groups that are easy to, to talk about and dismiss. We're people that God created in his image. And you can't pick a side because we're all vulnerable. And it's okay to admit that there are no easy answers. And it's okay not to, ex- uh, it's okay to, ex- uh, excuse me, it's not okay to excuse evil because it's fit- it fits the way that you already think. It's, it's okay to be challenged and to struggle, but to trust God. But it's not okay that if someone tells you they're hurting, for you to try to tell them that they're not. What should we do? We should act with compassion and courage. Like Onesimus who says, I'm going to find him. And I'm going to go be with him. He's hurting. I'm going to go hurt with him. The first century church was known for their compassion to everyone. And to be honest with you, it's sometimes, it's a little scary for me right now to say these things. Because you and I live in the same world. That someone's going to take part of what I've said or take part of what I've expressed here and, and try to twist it and turn it and make it fit their own plan. But we've got to have courage. We've got to have courage to say, This is what God's word says. And it's stretching me. But I want to be faithful. To his spirit. And to his leading. And so part of that scariness is for me. Opening myself up a little more. To say if you disagree with me. Come visit with me. Write me a letter. Send me an email. Come drink coffee with me in my backyard. Or 
wherever you want to meet. I would love to visit more. Because if you're hurting, I want to hurt with you. And I want to hear you. I want to be faithful that I would go where God goes. That I would be the Onesimus to find the person that's hurting. Let God spiritually stretch you so that you can love like He loves. Hold on to the gospel. Sin is destructive, but Christ stepped in and was oppressed for us. He took what we deserved. That Christ will one day judge all wickedness and that the Spirit is presently working to redeem humanity, including us that need to be redeemed and including using us to be a part of redeeming the world and part of bringing the world back to himself. That passage that we referenced earlier where Abraham entertained angels. Um, most Bible scholars actually believe that passage, when it talks about the angel of God, it talks about the pre-incarnate Son of God who came and visited Abraham. And it, we think that, or they think that, because it says, the Lord said to Abraham. And so you have this pre-incarnate Son of God who came to visit Abraham, and Abraham didn't even know it. And I tell you that because there's another passage where the pre-incarnate Son of God came in His incarnation in Matthew 25. And He told a parable. He said, at the end of the age, there's going to be this group, this herd of animals. And, and, and the Father is going to, to take some. He's going to take the sheep and put them on His right and the goats and put them on His left. And He's going to say to the sheep, rise, you are blessed. And to the sheep, away from Me. And the answer to the question is, well, why on earth such distinction? And Jesus' res response was, uh, when I was sick, you came and visited me. Whenever, whenever I was in need, you came and took care of me. And the sheep responded. Their response to him was, uh, the, the righteous ones reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. My prayers change my heart, O oh Lord. And I pray that our, our prayer as a church and as Christians in our culture now is God open our eyes, change our hearts, O oh Lord, to reflect you. And that we would, as the passage says, let brotherly love continue showing hospitality and remembering the vulnerable and mistreated. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I love you. I pray, God, that our initial response would be repentance. That, God, we would be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. But that, Holy Spirit, that you would work in us. And, God, I pray that wherever our word um, looks different, wherever our lives look different than what your word says, God, I pray that you would change our lives and help us to be faithful to you. Change us, O oh God, and help us to be faithful to let brotherly love continue. I love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.